قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي آيات الله حمتني غمرتني بالبركات تحفظني من همزات الشيطان ومن زلاتي آيات الله حمتني غمرتني بالبركات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, I'd like to start off by welcoming each and every single one of you on behalf of the IPCI and Markaz Manar Al-Fikr to what we call a businessman's facilitating dawa breakfast with our guest speaker Ustad Hamza Zosis from the UK Now I'm just going to speak very quickly for two minutes about two things The first is a broad overview of what is IPCI and Markaz Manar Al-Fikr People may not be aware so the IPCI basically, uh, if I had to divide the work that we do, I'd say the first department would be publications. Um, we do, you know, in the different languages, Qurans and different Dawah material. Together with this, we have a Dawah department headed by Muhammad Khan. And in this Dawah department, we have eight different branches around the country where a person is giving Dawah in that branch from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Together with that, we do university Dawah. We do Dawah at businesses, which is what this breakfast is going to be about. Then we have a comparative religion department where we train people how to, uh, how to debate with Christians, how to give da'wah more importantly, and how to answer questions about Islam. Now, Markaz Manar al-Fikr, which was founded by Mulana Uwais Dokrat here, their primary focus is on universities. So he has contact with 20 different MSAs around the country, and basically he sends out a flyer once a month, he does programs with them, you know, spiritual training, he does dawah programs with them. And together with this, Morana also started a helpline. So it's a helpline for anyone who has any question about Islam, whether you're a Muslim, a non-Muslim, someone struggling. And Alhamdulillah, just by setting up that helpline, we've seen multiple people accept Islam, where they message the helpline and they say, you know, I want to know more about Islam. And then they accept Islam based on that. So Markaz Manar Fikr and IPCI work hand in hand in a lot of these uh, projects. Now, the second thing that I just want to talk about quickly today uh, has to do with the overview of what we're going to do here today. So one of the most uh, disastrous things that ever happened to this Ummah was the fall of the Khilafah. I think everyone can, ex uh, can understand that. And when Muslims now move to non-Muslim countries, living there as minorities, with no one to oversee the Muslim community, it became imperative that every single you know, cog in the machine, so to speak, every single segment of society now worked hand in hand. So you have the business people, you have the ulama, you have the professionals, you have everyone who now needs to get together to make sure that the Muslim community is viable. And here at the IPCI and Markaz Manar al-Fikr, uh, one of the major segments of the community that we rely on are the business people. And the reason for that is not because of the money. But rather in the field of dawah, business people have something that's very unique and they have access to non-Muslims for about eight hours a day, right? And that in the field of dawah is a unique commodity. It's something that's extremely precious. So today's program is about how we can offer practical solutions and also how we can understand the need for dawah in all of these business places with all of our employees. How can we practically go about giving them the message uh, of Islam? So inshallah, we're going to have a qira'a by our qari uh, Imran Katrada and after that Sheikh Hamza will speak, Sheikh Muhammad Khan will speak and then uh, breakfast will be served inshallah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ وَأَمْوَالٌ اِقْتَرَفْتُمُوهَا وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا وتجارة تخشون كسادها ومساكن ترضونها أحب إليكم من الله 
أحب إليكم من الله ورسوله وجهاد في سبيله فتربصوا فتربصوا حتى يأتي الله بأمره والله لا يهدي القوم الفاسقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا عبادي الذين أسرفوا على أنفسهم لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم وأنيبوا إلى ربكم وأسلموا له من قبل من قبل أن يأتيكم العذاب ثم لا تنصرون واتبعوا أحسن ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم من قبل من قبل أن يأتيكم العذاب بغتة وأنتم لا تشعرون صدق الله العظيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم I seek refuge in Allah from Satan the cursed one بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah most gracious most merciful Say If it be that your fathers Your sons Your brothers Your mates That is your wives Or your kindred The wealth that ye have gained the commerce in which ye fear a decline, or the dwellings in which ye delight are dearer to you than Allah or his apostle, or the striving in his cause in jihad, then wait until Allah brings about his decision and Allah guides not the rebellious. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Say, O oh my servants who have transgressed against their souls, despair not of the mercy of Allah. For Allah forgives all sins, for He is oft forgiving, most merciful. Turn ye to your Lord in repentance and bow to His will before the penalty comes on you. After that, ye shall have or you shall not be helped. If any, and follow the best of the courses revealed to you from your Lord before the penalty comes on you of a sudden while ye perceive not, lest the soul should then say, Ah, woe is me, in that I neglected my duty towards Allah and was but among those who mocked. Sadaqullahu al -Azim. Verily, Allah has spoken the truth. Bismillah <laughs> ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's an honor and a pleasure to see familiar faces again. Respected mashayikh, businessmen, elders, and younger ones too. Alhamdulillah. May Allah bless every single one of you. May Allah preserve you. Grant you and your family the highest level in paradise and grant you and your loved ones the best in this life and the best in life to come. Amen. Say Ameen. Amen. You don't hear these du'as often, so say Ameen. <laughs> May Allah bless every single one of you. So my dear brothers, I want to talk about just a few minutes on the importance of having an Allah-centric and Akhira-centric vision for your life in order to be truly successful because sometimes when we get into business we have a misunderstanding of what true success is we have a kind of secondary or tertiary understanding 
Now, what we need to realize is we have to sometimes just remind ourselves that the greatest outcome, the greatest triumph, the greatest success is actually going to Jannah. Right? It's not doing well with your business. Although that should be a means for that. So why am I starting with the idea of success? Because it's going to ground us and frame our understanding and our approach to life in the correct way. The greatest success is going to Jannah. This is why if we had the choice of becoming extremely rich, like a multimillionaire, but breaking principle, and we had on the other hand, keeping to our principles and not doing so well, we would keep to our principles and not do so well, hopefully. But I know the business world doesn't work that way, unfortunately. But the point I'm trying to say is, the reason hypothetically we would choose principle over success, dunya success, is because we know what true success is, is going to Jannah. Is this clear? As Allah says, the greatest triumph is being saved from the fire, is going into Jannah. So this means now, everything we do must have an Akhira-centric aspect to what we do. And this includes our business. This includes what we do at home, what we do in the public domain. So we have an Akhira-centric mindset. Then we must have an Allah-centric mindset. Because to go to the Akhira, you have to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to love Allah, adore Allah, be humble before Allah, submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by doing so, inshallah, we're enveloped, enveloped in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We go to Jannah, which is the true success. So we have to have an Allah-centric mindset, which means what is the most pleasing thing to Allah in this context? I will guarantee you, you have never asked this question in the past week. Almost impossible. And I, statistically, we just say what is halal and what is haram. But I want you to think as businessmen, as people of influence, what is the most pleasing thing to Allah in my context? And that's the difference between discussing halal and haram. Because there is a hierarchy of halals. Some things, yes, you can do it. Other things are more pleasing to Allah. So this is why as people with, with responsibility and influence and money, we need to have an Allah-centric mindset. Which means what is the most pleasing thing to Allah in my particular context? You know your context better than anyone else, but ask the, the question. Don't just say what's halal and haram. Because if you want barakah in your life, you want to be in the barakah zone, you want success in the dunya and the akhirah, then you have to elevate the game. We have to choose the greater halal over the lesser halal. So you have to ask yourself the question, what is the most pleasing thing to Allah in my particular context? So when we have an akhirah centric mindset, an Allah-centric mindset, it helps develop a vision for what we want to achieve in the dunya. And it's very important that we have that vision because sometimes our vision is very individualistic. We complain about neo-capitalism and liberalism, but we're all liberals really. We're all capitalists really, let's not laugh about it, right? We're all infected by this disease, whether we like it or not. Because it's all about my business, my goals. In order to have true meaning and value in life, and inshallah, for it to be truly Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric, the vision for Islam, it should be greater than your individual projects and organizations, and the individual projects and organizations should be greater than the individual. But we just stop at our own space, thinking that we're going to have great success as a community and as an ummah. We're not, because we're just thinking about ourselves. The individual organizational business goal should be linked to a greater wider vision that's Allah-centric and Akhirah-centric in order for us to be successful. And this is very important for us to understand. So, given that's the fact, my dear brothers and elders, it's very important for us to focus on, it's very important for us to focus on doing the best that we can with what we have and with the visions that we have established in our organizations, businesses or in our own minds. And given the fact that you are people of influence with money, no one's asking for money today at all, so don't worry about that. But what they're asking from you is something even more important. 
is to open your business to the dawah. We have access to non-Muslims, thousands of non-Muslims, just by virtue of the different businesses that you have. And what IPCI have, have two key projects. One key project is that you allow them to come on a re relatively regular basis to actually talk to your non-Muslim staff. And number two, to have a mini bookshelf with Islamic literature that people can freely choose and pick leaflets and you could sponsor a bookshelf in your office. These are practical things to start moving forward a little bit in terms of opening the door to more barakah. And please, during the breakfast, connect with Muhammad Khan, the director, head of Dawa at IPCI. He would take your details and ensure that those two small projects happen within your offices or your business facility. Because it's very important that we actually are connected to the Dawah in that way. And, and continuing with the line of being Allah-centric and Akhira-centric, we're going to be asked on the Day of Judgment what we did with our people. Everyone is a shepherd, the Prophet ﷺ. Everyone's a leader. And you know, our flock isn't just our family, it's the people that we manage. You may manage 500 non-Muslims. Did we ever speak to them about Islam? We're going to be asked on the Day of Judgment. We're going to be asked on the Day of Judgment about how we engaged with them. And remember the importance of da'wah. Da'wah is better than any type of wealth. The famous hadith of the Prophet wasallam, when he said that if one person become, becomes Muslim through your hands, through the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's better than the, the red camels. Now the red camels at the time, time of the Prophet wasallam were like, was like the greatest wealth. So one non-Muslim becoming a Muslim is, is better than anything that you can acquire in this dunya. So frame it from that perspective. Also frame it from the perspective of being savvy. Because you know as business people, we like being savvy. You know you have these business pyramids and all of these business models that sometimes don't work. But this is the spiritual business model. The Prophet said that if you call someone to something good, you will get the reward of that good. So imagine just through your facilitation, one per person becomes Muslim. One of your workers becomes Muslim. And then they get married. That's two people. Then they have two kids. That's four people. And the two kids, they get married. That's six people now. And then they have two kids, it's two kids each. That's ten people. Within not even a generation, you're going to have the reward of the Salah, of the Hajj, of the Umrah, a share in the reward of the Dhikr, a share in the reward of all the good deeds. Now imagine the Day of Judgment. You're going to be seeing all of these good deeds that you never did yourself based on this hadith of the Prophet So understand and frame da'wah from that perspective. It's better than any type of wealth that you can acquire and the reward is beyond anything that you can acquire in this uh, dunya. As Allah says in the Quran, the, the, the mercy of Allah, the reward that Allah has for you is greater than any wealth they can amass. And then Allah continues about the kind of emptiness and the ephemeral nature of the dunya. So have an Allah-centric mindset, have an Akhira-centric mindset. Be like Sulaiman alayhi salam. You'll find an Allah-centric and Akhira-centric mindset in the dua of Sulaiman alayhi salam. When he did istighfar, so it's akhirah centric, he wants to be forgiven. He asked Allah for a kingdom that no one else would ever have. And implied in that he wanted to be a righteous king. And to have a righteous kingdom. This is like an akhirah centric, Allah centric vision. It's linked to the dunya but it's for his akhirah. He did istighfar, he wants a righteous king. He wants to be a righteous king. He's going to have a righteous kingdom that no one else has had. Similarly, with your businesses. Oh Allah, I want to be a great businessman, a successful businessman, of course. A multi-millionaire for the sake of Allah. To do more da'wah, to help my family and my friends. And yes, to my, take my portion of the dunya, for sure. Have my nice car. Have my one wife, my two wives, my three wives, my four wives. As many wives as, as is allowed, no problem. If Allah blesses you. Whatever you want, take it. But also have in mind 
the Allah-centric, Akhirah-centric nature of what you should do in your life. For the Ummah, for the community, for Dawah. Because that is the greatest reward. So this is the few words I wanted to mention to you. Have an Allah-centric mindset, an Akhirah-centric mindset. Understand that we have a great responsibility. There's a practical, and I like working on practical things. Sometimes we think of great projects and they never happen. I have this approach of, of, of an avalanche approach. When there's a mountain and there's a small rock and it falls and there's a bit of shaking, it turns to a small snowball and it becomes an avalanche. Similarly with the dawah. Open the door for the sake of Allah for basic projects such as they come regularly, maybe once a month to give a talk at your, at your business, that you have the flyers and the small bookshelf available for them. And then from that, Allah will give you more barak and open more doors. Yeah? And remember the importance of the da'wah. Allah's mercy and reward is greater than anything that we can amass. And even one person becoming Muslim is greater than the best type of wealth, as per the words of the Prophet. So, Jazakallah for listening. Please, I might be walking around to make sure that you're speaking to Muhammad Khan. Because, yeah, we have to hold ourselves to account. Yeah? And plus, I could be rude because I'm a guest. <laughs> I can get away with it, yeah? And I don't have the same culture, so I have an excuse. So I want at least one person from each table to take this action seriously. May Allah bless you. Jazakum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Awuz billahi min ash-shaytan wa rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Muhammad Khan. And uh, we, the Sheikh Hamza has a very, very important meeting uh, debate tomorrow night that was never covered before. Not by Sheikh Ahmed did that as well. The topic he'll tell you about it more. And we're trying to rush him to get back to to, to his research and to his uh, uh, preparation. I just want to tell you, uh, we will get down to breakfast just now. There's three things I want to raise. The first one is. Some 15 to 20 years ago, I think many of you know of somebody by the name of Marhum Joe Park, he used to work for Trin Clothing. So, um, Abdul Khalik was with me. So, when Mr. Late Mr. Zora Mullah used to visit him, one day when Abdul Khalik and I went, he told me, uh, it was over 10 years ago, you can go in the back and have a look. I went there one day and I see all these people praying, all my staff praying. So, I went to him, well, what's happening? And they didn't know, the one pastor is there. And I can't stop them because 10 o'clock to quarter past 10 or 10 to half past 10, they have tea time. So I asked the fellow, what you're doing? He says, no, it's called tea time ministries. There were separate ministries to go to companies and in tea time or lunch time, say five minutes pay. So he said, I can't do anything about it. So from that time to now, it's been in the back of my mind. However, for the last five years, we have something called, uh, which we call um, Dawa Quran Project. We go to companies and we speak to people to their staff in the tea time or in the lunch time. Like if you look there in the, in the warehouse we are. We speak to the staff there, right? Uh, that's one aspect. The second one is we put one of these counters. It's free, it's sponsored by IPCI, and we fill it up for you every month, right? Uh, with the material. Uh, very successful, if you look at the back of these pamphlets, open this middle one here. Can you see this gentleman here from Buildright? So every Bullright store has an info counter, and they started it actually. The brother by the name of Inayat Kassar in the Mabupani store, at the moment just sent me an order now to fill it up. Fill it up. The lady who's standing there is actually one of the heads of the Brits Department of Correctional Services, non-Muslim, and she I think she's the spiritual head. She actually came and took like about 50 Qur'ans in different languages to go give it to the Muslim prisoners in their prison. It has so many spin-offs that you can't imagine uh, what happens after that. The second thing is, these gazebos that you're looking here, we sponsored quite a few of them, but generally, I don't know if you notice, in, in big shopping centers, you have something called pop-ups. Different companies can put their pop-ups. So we can also put our pop-up in your parking lot. And we have this new concept where we offer chocolates, the small ones, not the big ones, and we say you answer three questions. And Alhamdulillah, would, uh, we do that at business parkings, but we did it in the last three months in seven university campuses with Mulana Oasis, Mulana Al Fikr. East Fikr is mainly in campuses for universities. And inshallah, in August, we'll do another seven universities. We've done them in KZN and, and in Johannesburg. 
The strange thing is, university going students, you ask them who is Muhammad, they don't know. You ask them what is a Muslim, they don't know. So they fail to, but they still want the chocolate. So anyways, we make an excuse, but for three then chocolate, they spend 15 minutes to half an hour giving you their time. So that is the second thing I want to say. The third thing I want to say is, I don't want to put the brother on the spot, but he just walked in. Uh, apart from the staff that you have, right? Oh, I just want to correct it. Some are ulema and business people together in South Africa. I don't want to say who it is. But we have that wonderful thing in South Africa where you have people who are alims, people who are businessmen and qualified professionals and, and all in one as well sometimes. So in the companies where you have staff, 300, 100, 50 staff who are working for you 15, 20 years. And I know personally that many of the kids were put through school by Muslim business people and they are still not Muslim. But they don't know who Allah is. They don't know what Tawheed is. They don't know what the Quran is. We're not telling them to become Muslim. But when we go, we're telling them we came to educate you about what Islam is. Because many of them have misconceptions. And to prove that to you, not only would your staff... Uh, I just sent a brother now a book and I told him when you have your reps, your reps that come from the smart companies, you have reps that comes to you and you have your staff as well. Give the, that one rep that's a little chatty than the others, give him a book. And I have a very good book for him. Well, what I'm saying is, if that, that there's a brother who's here, who has 300 people working for him himself, but there's another Muslim businessman, he's Marhum. Now, many of you may know him, Mr. Kadu. He worked for Exquisite. So, Mr. Mr. Kadu was dealing with somebody repping, right? For material and things like Mr. Kadu used to go to China quite often. And so he was dealing with a gentleman who had another business, but in a way how you deal with a rep. So this gentleman, Mr. Kadu, decided to talk to you about Islam. So this gentleman told Mr. Kadu, I'm dealing with your Muslims for over 20 years. Not one of them ever spoke to me about Islam. And today, Alhamdulillah, he's Muslim three years. He just came back from our brother Terence Tariq Naidu and brothers acknowledge him. And he has 300 people working for him, some of his workers, some of his staff alone. And we thank Brother Ahmed for being there to guide him in the working place. However, if it was not through Mr. Kadu speaking <coughs> to his rep, speaking to him, and then to the staff, I mean, we, went did that one, we did speaking to Mr. Kadu's staff in the company. I'm saying, don't tell them to become Muslim, but your duty is to deliver the message. And it can have some amazing ramifications. Just leave the message. And Brother Tariq's life has changed compared to what it was. Okay, I have to say this if you don't mind. He used to give the church 25,000 rand every month on the 25th. And if the money was not there, the pastor used to hound him and come and sit at the, at the this thing. Yet he when he went to church, he didn't know whether he's in the church or in a discotheque. They took the money and they built a discotheque. And when he became Muslim, the church phoned him and told him that they want him to come to the church and explain why he left Christianity. And they brought two missionaries to counteract us. So we had an entire program in the church. Some people are here. Dr. Abu Yumi was there, Sheikh Suwet and him. And we had to counteract. And they brought people to this thing because they didn't want to lose him. But Alhamdulillah, Allah guys, we don't guide. So thank you for that. I'm sorry I went uh, over the limit. We'll take two questions and we'll start. Any questions? Okay. They want the brother to say a few words. Sorry? They want the brother to say a few words. Yeah, sure. I want to say Jazakallah to the IPCI team. So involved in giving dawah. And I was a pastor in my previous life. And the best decision I made was to come to Islam. I cannot explain it in tears to my eyes. And it was an uphill when we made the decision because, when I made the decision because there were lots of people against me in the Christianity regime. But I thank Allah that I had my brother standing with me and helping me. And um, I'm very involved with Mr. Khan because I feel that when I asked Mr. Khan the late Mr. Kadu question. I don't feel that we're doing enough to propagate this truth, to get involved in this truth. I feel strongly that if we can take this truth to the Christians, because that's where I work, 
A lot of my families are pastors and deacons. And always over the table we're having discussions and challenges and things like that because it's difficult. And um, we need more done. You know, apart from our businesses and things like this, we need a lot of dawa work because I was lost. I was totally lost into this, what Christianity preaches about the discotheque because I've taken Mr. Khan there to see what is happening. And it's shocking how people are being misled. They moving on to new things. You know, we we still on the chocolate, mm. as he mentioned, we still on the small chocolate. But they are doing fast things to reap in because the more they reap in, the bigger the bank balance. Mm. It's all about that. Uh, I've been there. I've seen it. And I've witnessed it, that is why I can speak so sternly about it. I've been on Radio al Ansar as well, and I've got blasted from the Christian guys. And it's a struggle. It is a daily struggle. Apart from our businesses and what have you, we have to do more. Just not little stands, don't get me wrong. Alhamdulillah, it's right. But we need to move forward because what they dream in is, is totally different. You know, they've gone on platforms, on social media platforms. They're having these youth meetings on Friday where they're capturing you know, all the young youth. And, and, and that's where they work. The youth is the future of our society. So if we can capture the youth's minds now, they've got them for the rest of their lives. So we too need to come together. I really love it, you know. Come together, partnership together, and let's take Islam to the next level. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh, brothers and I see sister here as well. Let me take part of your presence. Um, having heard the uh, attendant last night's program at Masjid Salam and having heard Brother Hamza also speaking and our brother here who um, I must say, Alhamdulillah, your journey in life is very inspiring and your message is very profound. We have a serious problem in, in our society. I mean, Alhamdulillah, my three children have now, the youngest one 20, my youngest daughter is 20, the other daughter 23, my son is turning 26 tomorrow. And uh, fortunate that we've been able to mold them and shape them the right way. But the challenge of the youth is a serious challenge. And we have various factors, this being the biggest culprit social media and the influence, especially the negative influences. The LGBT menace, drugs, and so many others. And you have a problem with today's generation. Like yesterday I was talking to Dr. Suleiman, Faisal Suleiman of Sam at uh, the wedding. And he was just telling me that, you know, when we talk to our kids today, we have to be so careful and well guarded in what we say. Even if they're adults, because in our days when our parents forget them telling us anything sternly and harshly, even just by looking at us with those eyes, the message was there. And that's the challenge we have. And I and appeal to every one of you that we need to work hard on this. Because if we do not mold our youth the right way, as what our brother said, we need to work on it now. Then we're going to lose them. And the rise of atheism it's horrific. Youngsters becoming gay, lesbian, it's sickening, especially from affluent homes. And, and you'll find that, you know, when they go out of town to study because they basically not being monitored by their parents, etc. We have all those challenges, so that's something also we need to work with. And that's why Dawa is so important. We need to develop Dawa within our own society as well as reach out to the other communities as well. That's what I appreciate. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum uh, to our Sheikh. And, uh, thanks for having this. I, I just have a question for the Sheikh, uh, since we're all businessmen here, professionals as well. As we know, Indonesia became Muslim through good business ethics uh, by the Arabs that went to Indonesia and converted the Malaysians into Islam. Would the Sheikh's advice? us here as businessmen to use business and work ethics and your honesty in trade as a means for love. Sure. 
I'm not a sheikh, by the way, but um, I'm more of a milkshake. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I think this is very important. We need to have a principle-led life. And sometimes we, <coughs> and we do this at home. Let me give you an example. The brother was talking about the youth. And sometimes we're very academic, we're academically centric to the degree that our children would identify the sense of worth with the results. At home, we don't do this. If my son misses Fajr, hypothetically, right, say he missed Fajr, he would get more, hopefully, more of a response than if he failed his exam. But in your households, where you have the topers and the beards and the thobes, if he misses Fajr, it's not a problem. If he misses Fajr many times just for exams, it's not a problem. Now, I'm giving you this example to show about the moral priorities that we have, right? We become very utilitarian. You know, what is its use? Is it going to give me the goal that I want? Which is usually status, degrees, academic profile, money, increased business. But the reason I mentioned the Allah-centric, Akhira-centric mindset that we should have in the presentation is to link everything to the Akhira and Allah. That includes your business. And you need to ask yourself a question. If I had to sign a contract that would increase my business by a thousand percent but there was one clause that was not in line with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would you sign that contract? I think some of you would unfortunately reap what you sow and the interesting thing about risk is that if you did it the haram way or the halal way, it's set. So you could gamble and become a multimillionaire. And I laugh at those people. SubhanAllah, you would have become a multimillionaire without gambling. You just used the wrong means. And that's how we have to link everything to Allah and to our worldview. And having a principle-led leadership, a principle-led business, a principle-led life, Allah, <coughs> you sleep well, you're respected, people know how to deal with you because you have your red lines and you enroll other people in your behavior and you're admired. Wow, this guy could have made much, much more money but he did it because he fears Allah. He did it because he believes in Allah. He did it because Allah has told him to do something and, he, and his relationship with Allah is worth more than mountains of gold. If we were always like this, South Africa would be like Indonesia, right? So you just have to stay within the baraka zone. Do not break principle just for some success, because that success will become your failure. But if you hold on to your principle, and you don't get the dunya success, that will become your ultimate glory and your triumph. And we have to believe in this. It's like the way of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, when he was offered power one year and not having power another year, he was offered riches and money and women. And what did he say? If you put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I'm not going to give up this message. And look, the most successful man on the planet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every microsecond, someone is saying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the Adhan, which includes his name. He's the most off praised human being on the planet. We know in Ilm al Rijal, in the study of men, of the biographies of the men and women in Hadith, in the Ahadith, we have around 10,000 biographies of Sahaba, I believe. 10,000. Name me 10 people connected to Trump or Obama. The point is, you have to have, don't give up long-term success for short-term glory because look most of you got grey beards man apart from you <laughs> most of you got grey beards most of you grey hair getting old Just think about what happened 20 years ago it happened 20 seconds ago you know be serious with your 
business with your life and I'm telling you it will give you open doors that you would never imagine it might not even open business doors who cares I mean how many loaves of bread can you fit in your stomach every day at the end of the day I mean some more than others <laughs> yeah of course but you get me one two khalas but Allah will open other doors of da'wah of barakah of maybe you know your position in the community your influence on others your position in the global ummah honestly and you'll, you'll see things that you've never seen before and Allah will take you places so in a nutshell always stick to principle and I remember what I said in the beginning and you should ask this question every day because I know you haven't asked it what does Allah want from me in this particular context what is the most pleasing thing to Allah in this particular context not what's halal and haram I would even argue to be a good businessman that's ethical don't even do the halal and haram do the thing that's most pleasing because there are some things that are you're allowed to do it might be a bit blameworthy but it's not sinful there are other things that are closer to the optimal pleasure of Allah stay in that barakah zone and Allah will take you places I'll give you an example when I was managing Aira to resurrect it from all to the dead yeah okay not the dead but basically it wasn't doing that well we had a principle called the baraka zone so we'd have like lots of shahadas or like filipino women or something and you know sometimes they may want to put a track that sounds like music or they want to basically maybe show them give the shahada i said no i said make sure it sounds like voice and blur the women out and in some of the uh, videos, it didn't look very nice. Well, Allah, I think we we increased our funds by 500%. Just so stay in the baraka zone. And don't do it one off. You have to be consistent and intentional about it. And Allah would open doors. And He'll give you wealth, maybe not in money, but in life, in health, in love. Many of you have probably have rotten relationships at home. It must be the case. You're businessmen. <laughs> You have to sacrifice something, yeah? Imagine having that mindset. What is the most pleasing thing to Allah in this contract, in this context, in this relationship, in this and that and the other? And then when you have that mindset, Allah would open doors for you in so many ways, inshaAllah. Yeah. To the point where the, a whole nation was opened for us, right? As you mentioned. So, stick to principle. I'm very, very fond of someone who sticks to I consider them a man if you don't stick to principle you're not a man mm. I don't care how many hairs you have in your face I don't consider you a man stick to principle so important yeah. we had this issue in Pakistan I was in Pakistan and about 90% generally speaking of women do not get any inheritance in Pakistan but Allah if you know the inheritance rules women get inheritance in actual fact in some cases they get more than men right depending where they are on the lineage and the closest to the deceased. But these women get nothing. And these men, they got beards, they, got, they go to Tablik Jama'ah as well. Some of these men, unfortunately. They're in the righteous community. And because of culturally, they don't give their women any inheritance at all. They're literally thieves. They are thieves. These men are not men, you're a thief. And I, I remember once I was giving a lecture in Pakistan, I was telling them all off, they were like, wow. Because I, I, I find it, like in my culture, to do that to your sister is the most demasculating thing that you could ever do. It's like, I want, to, I want to puke. I want to puke. But these men, because of tribal issues, because of culture, this, that, the other, whatever it is, they think they could play with the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm like, you're not a man, you're a weasel. Come outside, I will fight every single one of you. Yeah, they need this. How can you claim you want sharia, you want this, you want khilafah, beer, topi, tabliq, dawah, and yet you can't even give your own sister what is her due. But if you stick to principle, then you're my inner circle. And that should be with, and that's how we should all act. I don't care how much money someone has. I was brought up like that. Like, I don't care. I don't care, frankly. It doesn't make a difference to me what car you have. I was brought up differently. My dad had a different mindset. What I care about is that you're principled. And that's how we should be with others. And the reason I'm mentioning this now as well is because you're going to create that vibe and that community. And if you're very close with people, 
you know, you don't care about what he, who his father was. I, I don't care who your father was. Sorry, bro. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care. I care about you. Are you close to Allah? So I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to be your friend to optimize you. Because that's what true love is. That's what true relationships are. That you see that they have a huge potential and you want them to reach that potential, even if it means you sacrifice. So if I know he's, he's, he's doing well in some areas, but in business he's not following some principles, I'm going to think, how am I, in the best way, according to the sunnah, am I going to optimize him so there's an optimal version of this person? That's how we should be with each other. But we're very British with each other. Like, you know, you know, very kind of formal sometimes and ceremonial and like, you know, because he's a high value guy in terms of money, I'm not going to tell him off on this area because, you know, no, you should. That doesn't mean anything on the day of judgment at the end of the day. It's going to come crashing down on top of his head and your head as well for not saying anything. Anyway, I think it's time for breakfast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عسمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عسمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي آيات الله حمتني غمرتني بالبركات تحفظني من همزات الشيطان ومن زلاتي آيات الله حمتني غمرتني بالبركات تحفظني من همزات الشيطان ومن زلاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طهر